What is up, weather enthusiasts? I'm your host, Pat's Path Predictor. Let's get right into the weather. All right, so here's the situation we have for you, ladies and gentlemen. Hurricane season has officially started. It is June 1st, 2024, which means for the next six months, the Pat's Path Predictor channel, as well as our tropical team at Storms United, will be at hard at work giving you updates on latest tropical weather and possible threats that are going to be going on your way from the Carolinas all the way down to the Lesser Antilles because this year is going to be a very busy season according to all the implications we have taken a look at. We have some new computer models to take a look at as well and we're going to be kind of giving uh, an overview of what we could see over the first two weeks of June as well as some climate models and everything like that as well as some of the other indicators that we are potentially looking at such as the global sea temperatures, the ocean heat content, and all the other stuff as as well as some ENSO analysis. So with that being said, let's jump right into it. We're going to go ahead and start with the forecasting first. We're going to start with the European, and we're going to move over to the uh, all of these beautiful models right here to kind of give a consensus right here, the European, the AI model right here, the GFS, the CMC, the NavGem icon, all those that we used last year. And whenever our tropical system does happen, we will be using all these lovely models right there. The HWRF, the HMON, the HFS models right here, and the GFS as well to boot. So with that being said, I know I've been rambling for about a minute or so right here. So let's go ahead and keep go uh, get right into it. So here's what we have for the European model. What I'm going to be doing with this is I'm going to be looking at three main indicators going into this right here. I'm going to be looking at the, like the radar and the main sea level pressure itself, and then I'm going to be looking at the moisture content as well as the wind shear to kind of give you an indicator of what we may be looking at. So the European is not looking very active right here based off of uh, what we're just seeing right here. So there's a couple of reasons for this. For starters, for the month of June, you don't have very uh, good amounts of wind shear. You don't have a particularly large area of weak wind shear. This is what we're looking at right here. Areas of over 50 knots across much of the region over here. If we go ahead and pull that up. Yeah, this is completely unfavorable for tropical development at this current point in time. We're looking at over 50 knots of wind shear all across the main development region, across the Caribbean, across the Gulf of Mexico. Pretty much that's how you start June off right there with pretty strong wind shear. This is expected to weaken over the next couple of months. And as well as the El Nino start completely weakening and the La Nina starting to kick in eventually, we're going to see those values start to be to plummet and become lower than average. So here's what we have going on right here. We're going to show you what we have, kind of the, the forecast coming up, and see kind of how the ENSO cycle will affect this over the next couple of weeks as we are expecting a rapid shift from El Nino to a more neutral to La Nina region by the end of June. So this is what we have with the ENSO, well not the ENSO, um, the wind shear right here in the next five days interestingly enough from this uh, uh, from this run right here we are seeing a weak weaker area of wind shear across much of the main development region right there which is pretty interesting and could open up the possibility for some tropical development but there are a couple of areas that I, we need to take a look at first but regardless we are seeing some areas of like broken wind shear this is typical for june you're going to see stuff like that but what is, isn't inter as typical interestingly enough is periods of like really weak wind shear even if it's just for 24 hours this looks more like a shear occurring in july than shear in june here's how june shear works it's usually very persistent it calms down for a couple of days across a couple of small areas, and then it goes back to normal. But this is July shear, interestingly enough, from last year, where July, you start to see this kind of overall oscillating pattern in the, in the streak right there, where the highest wind shear is. And you start to see kind of this, these areas of lower wind shear that don't only last a couple of days or so, but they do persist and they do get more co uh, common as a pattern starts to persist right here, which I find pretty interesting all ready to take a look at right there. Now let's go ahead and look at the moisture component because what we're doing with this is we're monitoring the Sahara dust and the dry air generally across the Atlantic. And generally what I've been finding is the Sahara dust hasn't been as persistent as it has been like last year because last year and two years ago we were seeing very persistent Sahara dust in the month of Ju uh, June going into the hurricane season. But 
in around, but last year we started seeing a huge amount of dust just start weakening around August. But interestingly enough, that dust there is a few plumes that'll be moving through the Caribbean and everything like that, but it's not nearly as much as what we were seeing last year or two years ago, which is the primary reason why we didn't see an active hurricane season in 2022. But that was two years ago, and that was still when Ian made landfall in southwest Florida over there. So that's something to take a look at. That's what I'm paying attention to with the European. I want to see what the GFS is also saying as well, as well as the European AI model. Yeah, the GFS typically has more of a moist bias, especially as you go down the road. But to overall, we're not looking at nearly as much dry air and nearly as much Sahara dust as we were looking at last year, which I find kind of interesting right there. Here's the European. Unfortunately, the AI model doesn't do that. So we'll see if the CMC can do uh, can do that as well. Yeah, only the Euro and the GFS can really do that, unfortunately. I wish we had more access to more computer models that would kind of give us an indicator of the Sahara dust and everything like that. But yeah, this is looking like a, more, more of a, an, a passive pattern for the first two weeks of June so far. Although I will say the second uh, two weeks of June, will we might start to get into an active pattern based on a couple of climate models that I've been paying attention to. For, uh, that have just been released just last night. So we're going to go ahead and jump into that in just a second, but I want to go ahead and lay out some of the conditions that we need to look out for for hurricane season. This is partly a forecast video, partly of, hey, Patrick, what do we need to look out for? Hey, Patrick, you're talking about all this stuff again, but you're not telling us what to look out for for your future videos. Where's the tutorial, Patrick? Well, this is kind of, we're going to kind of uh, go into that a little bit right there. We're going to go ahead and start talking about the global sea temperatures. Nice and easy right here with what we have going on. Simple concept. We're looking at the, uh, the surf, uh, how warm the surface sea temperatures are across much of the Atlantic Ocean right here, particularly in the western part of the Atlantic Ocean over here where hurricane development is more of a threat. Uh, but we still should not ignore the main development region either because considering what we were what we're seeing and considering what we were having last year this is way warmer than what we were both hoping for and what we had last year because across the Atlantic Ocean we're seeing much warmer waters than average like Across the Atlantic, there weren't very many hurricanes that moved into the Gulf. We had a Dahlia, and we didn't really have anything move into the Caribbean either. And all that warm water just sat there and just idly waited for spring to come around, and then the water starts to uh, ramp up and starts to warm. So that's what we're paying attention to right here. Essentially, what we're looking at across these global sea temperatures right there, 28 plus degrees Celsius across the entire area, like when we talked about this last time, when our last tropical update, the 28 degrees Celsius was concentrated at the loop current. Now it's across the entire Gulf of Mexico, and I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more than 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who live in the United States to kind of move, uh, to kind of start to uh, pop up outside of the Bay of Campeche, because what we have right now is water that is primed for hurricane development already in the month of June. Again, the only reason we haven't seen that is because of a combination of low vorticity as well as min shear and dry air that's been persistent. So, yeah, we'll have to pay attention to that. But this is an interesting thing I'm taking a look at. I'm going to try to zoom in on this real quick. 30 to plus degrees Celsius across the Caribbean portion of Cuba right there. And where the Isle of Youth is, we are looking at... 32 plus degree Celsius or 88 plus degree Fahrenheit water already in the month of June. That is something you need to pay attention to right there, folks. That is something right there. And I pray to God that that doesn't expand further than that right there. But given that what the nature of this hurricane season, I have a bad feeling that it will. And anything that goes into that will really start to rapidly intensify especially when you start to factor in ocean heat content. What is ocean heat content? It's essentially a measurement of how warm the water is and how deep that water is. It's essentially a math equation. I'm not going to go over that right here. That's a dynamics problem, and I'm not going to do that here. So anyway, this is what we have right here. Here's the ocean heat content. This is how warm these waters are and how deep these waters are, and it's measured by kilojoules per square centimeter, which is essentially a measurement of energy, essentially a me measurement of how much energy these waters have, a kind of like a gas tank. How much fuel do you have in the gas tank? Well, this thing is refueling all, uh, already, and we're already, like, 
this is like this is what you would consider a full tank of gas when you don't have a, a full tank of gas. Like a full tank of gas in a regular season right here, but not a full tank of gas for an explosive season. I know this analogy kind of make doesn't make very much sense, but I'm trying to explain it in the best way I can because we're already seeing OHC values of over 150 uh, kilojoules per centimeter over uh, near Jamaica, which that doesn't start to flare up until August, generally. It's June 1st. That kind of stuff is something I'm paying attention to. And we're also seeing areas of well over 100 OHC across the Lesser Antilles, across the Caribbean. We saw this in late June and early July last year when things started to really explode in temperature, when the waters really, uh, warm waters really started to go deep. We're already seeing that a month ahead of last year. That's something that is really raising alarm bells for me right now. And raising alarm bells, it should raise alarm bells for everybody. And those waters are expected to continue to rise. This is what we have. This is the climate reanal uh, reanalyzer right here. This is the global surface sea temperatures across the North Atlantic. This is the average that we have right here. Attempt, essentially, in layman's terms, what this means is this is the average of the sea surface temperatures across the Gulf, uh, not the Gulf, the Atlantic Ocean from six uh, from the equator to 60 degrees north where the where the pole, poles start. That's what we're paying attention to right here, and this is ranges from zero to 80 deg uh, 80 degrees west, which is almost all the way to uh, to the east coast over there. So that's what we have. We're already way ahead of schedule. We are about 0.4 degrees Celsius. This isn't in one area either. This is across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Like we're much warmer than uh, than we were last year, just in retrospect. And look at the gap that we saw from 2023 to the next highest area in 2022. We saw a half a degree an increase with that. We're already seeing a 0.4 degrees Celsius increase on top of that. And we still have two and a half to three months left to go for this to surge and for this to really ramp up and for the waters to really warm up. And what we'll possibly see is we'll see 30 degrees Celsius here in the Gulf, 30 degrees Celsius all over the Caribbean, 30 degrees Celsius, at least in parts of the Western Maine Development Region, as well as parts of the Atlantic Basin around the Bahamas, east coast of Florida, Everything right there, and maybe some 32 degrees Celsius areas across uh, across more parts of the Caribbean, which is something I absolutely do not want to see. Now, that's something I've been paying attention to with uh, with that. Another thing I'm ta uh, taking a look at is the ENSO forecast so far. Here's what we have going on. This is the latest. This they actually updated this on May 20th over here. And this is what we're paying attention to. Right now, we're looking at a more of a neutral fa uh, phase going forward than El Nino. It is still officially a uh, status of El Nino. But based off of what I'm seeing with the ocean analysis, based off of what I'm seeing with this right there, this is looking more like a neutral setup than an El Nino setup. The only reason it's not been declared neutral just yet, uh, yet, and I personally think it will in the next in the next two weeks, is because Region Four has been pretty stubborn and has been holding on for dear life with those above average temperatures. Those are expected to collapse in the next couple of months or so as we start to move into a La Nina, and they are forecasting the La Nina to happen sometime between uh, around July, uh, the July region, the June, July, August area. That's when they're forecasting it to happen. That's what JJA stands for, June, July, August. That's a three-month mean of what we're forecasting. And already, we're almost at a 50% chance of that happening in the month of July. Personally, I think this is going to be happening in the month of July, uh, July around early to mid-July, based off of the trends I've noticed with the sea surface temperatures and just the absolute collapse of what we're seeing right here with the anomalies right there. So that's definitely something to pay attention to. And what that will do is it will weaken the wind shear. It'll weaken the trade winds. And it'll cause for a possibility of more uh, uh, tropical stuff, to, uh, tropical storms, tropical hurricanes, uh, major hurricanes to happen all across the region. So here's what we have. I'm going to take a look at the wind shear anomalies. Unfortunately, I wish the can sips would actually give us that. Uh, I'll have to use the CFS monthly to see what we are potentially looking at right there. The CFS monthly has been pretty interest, uh, interesting to take a look at right there. For the month of June, it's having a much lower wind shear area than average right there, which personally, I'm not, I'm, we'll have to see what happens in the next couple of weeks to kind of vet, verify that. 
but I am paying a close attention to that as we continue to see more of these runs pop in. July, we start to see an increase of wind shear across the main development region. I'm not 100% sure how this is going to really reflect, although I will say September and October, we start to get lower wind shear values than possible according to the CFS. So that's going to be interesting. I want to see if the NMME they don't provide that either. But that's one thing I'm also potentially looking at. CANSIPs, though, this is what the main thing I'm looking at, and this is why I'm very concerned for the month of June. Here's what we have. We have a bunch of moisture just concentrated across much of the Caribbean, especially in the Greater Antilles. For context, this is what we were looking at on the May 1st run. We are still looking at a really bad situation across much of the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, especially, but into Haiti, parts of Cuba, everything like that with increased precipitation, uh, more moisture than average across these regions. This is what we have for June, a very concentrated across the Caribbean and very concentrated across Bahamas and the Greater Antilles. Now, am I saying that this is going to generate into tropical development? No, that's not how exactly this works. This can be attributed to just thunderstorm, tropical thunderstorms moving through and just, uh, just not really developing because of wind shear or anything like that. But what I am concerned about is kind of that what the precipitation will provide. What it will do is it'll essentially uh, allow for a more moist environment. And the big question will be going month in the months forward is can the Sahara dust pick up and can it cause uh, the, uh, this whole hurricane season to shut down at a moment's notice? And based off of some of the trends I am noticing it's looking increasingly unlikely, and it's lookingly incre looking increasingly likely that we are going to be seeing major uh, a major action going on starting around, I'd say, around uh, around mid-July. Going, We'd start to see the cogs start to rotate with more science developing. August, you'd start to see really big stuff happen. And then September, you'd see just a massive barrage, kind of what we saw in 2020. Now, June, we're not going to see no activity. I don't think we will. I don't think anyone in the meteorology community will. And based off of what I'm I'm seeing right there, there's the possibility we could see four or five named tropical storms across, uh, during the month of June if everything plays out right. Now, are any of these going to be hurricanes? We're not 100% sure yet. It's going to depend on the wind shear and how it tackles the dry air issue if it pops up. But I will tell you, the warm waters are more than enough to, uh, to cause that, and the ocean heat content is more than enough, uh, than enough to be worried about. The main question is, what will the shear do, and how will the ENSO react? That's some questions that we'll continue covering here on the Pat's Path Predictor channel. We're going to be updating you more regularly. I know I haven't been on as much. I've been uh, working on some other stuff for uh, for summer. I'm taking a math class again. I know the grind doesn't stop for school or anything like that. But hey, we're going to start updating you more regularly. There just hasn't been much tropical weather. I know there was a lot of severe weather and everything like that. Again, I've been pretty busy with what I've been do uh, doing with school. So I apologize for not uh, being here more frequently. I do hope you enjoy the documentaries, though. I've been really cranking out a lot, and they've been really uh, turning out really well. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you are new, and be sure to leave a like on the video if you liked it. With that being said, be sure to join the Discord server if you want to help us out with this hurricane season. The link to that is right over there. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day, guys. Stay safe.